Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teachers, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. In this video, we're going to be doing a read through of chapter six, otherwise known as the remarkable incident of Dr. Lanyon. I'll pause every now and then just to make sure that you're happy with what's going on, because some of this can be a little bit complicated. Do read along with me because it makes sense to both listen and read at the same time, particularly if your exam is closed text and you need to know it really well. Let's get started. The remarkable incident of Dr. Lanyon. Time ran on. Thousands of pounds were offered in reward for the death of Sir Danvers was resented as a public inquiry. But Mr. Hyde had disappeared out of the ken of the police as though he had never existed. Much of his past was unearthed, indeed, and all disreputable. Tales came out of the man's cruelty, at once so callous and violent, of his vile life, of his strange associates, of the hatred that seemed to have surrounded his career. But of his presence, present whereabouts, not a whisper. From the time he had left the house in Soho on the morning of the murder, he was simply blotted out. And gradually, as time drew on, Mr Utterson began to recover from the hotness of his alarm and to grow more at quiet with himself. The death of Sir Danvers was, to his way of thinking, more than paid by the disappearance of Mr Hyde. And now that the evil influence had been withdrawn, a new life began for Dr Jekyll. He came out of his seclusion, renewed relations with his friends, became once more their familiar guest and entertainer. And whilst he had always been known for charities, he was now no less distinguished for religion. He was busy. He was much in the open air. He did good. His face seemed to open and brighten as if with an inward consciousness of service. And for more than two months, the doctor was at peace. So Hyde has disappeared off the face of the earth. And whilst he's been gone, everyone has found out how bad he really was. Like just how many crimes committed, how many dreadful things that he did. But the good news is, is that since he's disappeared, Dr. Jekyll has gone back to his old, old ways of being charitable and friendly and open. So very different from the Jekyll of the previous chapter. Um, and he is now as known for his religious sort of actions as he was for his charitable actions. So since Hyde has gone, he has become more religious. On the 8th of January, Utterson had dined at the doctor's with a small party. Lanyon had been there and the face of the host had looked from one to the other as in the old days when the trio were inseparable friends. On the 12th, and again on the 14th, the door was shut against the lawyer. The doctor was confined to the house, Paul said, and saw no one. On the 15th, he tried again and was again refused. And having now been used for the last two months to see his friend almost daily, he found this return of solitude to weigh upon his spirits. The fifth night he had in guest to dine with him, and the sixth he betook himself to Dr Lanyon's. So after all of this positivity and openness and, you know, two months of being a great guy, suddenly the doors are closed again and Lanyon is not allowed to see his friend Jekyll. So mystery back on. So it goes to Lanyon's. There, at least, he was not denied admittance. But when he came in, he was shocked at the change which had taken place in the doctor's appearance. He had his death warrant written legibly upon his face. The rosy man had grown pale his flesh had fallen away. He was visibly bolder and older. And yet it was not so much these tokens of a swift physical decay that arrested the lawyer's notice as a look in the eye and quality of manner that seemed to testify to some deep-seated terror of the mind. It was unlikely that the doctor should fear death. And yet that was what Utterson was tempted to suspect. Yes, he thought, he is a doctor. He must know his own state and that his days are counted and the knowledge is more than he can bear. And yet when Utterson remarked on his ill looks, it was with an air of great firmness that Lanyon declared himself a doomed man. I have had a shock, he said, and I shall never recover. It is a question of weeks. Well, life has been pleasant. I liked it. Yes, sir. I used to like it. I sometimes think if we knew all, we should be more glad to get away. Jekyll is ill too, observed Utterson. Have you seen him? But Lanyon's face changed and he held up a trembling hand. 
I wish to see or hear no more of Dr Jekyll, he said in a loud, unsteady voice. I am quite done with that person, and I beg that you will spare me any allusion to one whom I regard as dead. Tut, tut, said Mr Utterson. And then, after a considerable pause, can't I do anything? he inquired. We are three very old friends, Lanyon. We shall not live to make others. Nothing can be done, returned Lanyon. Ask himself. Well, he will not see me, said the lawyer. I am not surprised at that, was the reply. Some day, Utterson, after I am dead, you may perhaps come to learn the right and wrong of this. I cannot tell you. And in the meantime, if you can sit and talk with me of other things, for God's sake, stay and do so. But if you cannot keep clear of this accursed topic, then in God's name go, for I cannot bear it. So strange behaviour. When Jekyll goes to visit Lanyon, who's always been described as healthy, hearty, dapper, red-faced, you remember from the previous chapter, now suddenly he's got his death warrant written legibly on his face, i.e. his face makes him look like he's going to die and it's legible, like it's clear. And what seems to have caused on, uh, brought on this deathly appearance is some shock, some moment of fear that he, he's had that obviously relates to Jekyll hence him refusing not only to, you know, to ever see Jekyll again, but he doesn't even want to hear his name. He doesn't want to talk about him. And he says that to Utterson quite clearly, you know, go if you want to talk about him because I will not speak his name. So very, very mysterious. As soon as he got home, Utterson sat down and wrote to Jekyll, complaining of his exclusion from the house and asking the cause of this unhappy break with Lanyon. And the next day brought him a long answer, often very pathetically worded and sometimes darkly mysterious in drift. The quarrel with Lanyon was incurable. I do not blame our old friend, Jekyll wrote, but I share his view that we must never meet. I mean from henceforth to lead a life of extreme seclusion. That means isolation, so he doesn't want to ever see anyone. You must not be surprised, nor must you doubt my friendship, if my door is often shut even to you. You must suffer me to go my own dark way. I have brought on myself a punishment and a danger that I cannot name. If I am the chief of sinners, I am the chief of sufferers also. I could not think that this earth contained a place for sufferings and terrors so unmanning, and you can do but one thing, Utterson, to lighten this destiny, and that is to respect my silence. Utterson was amazed. The dark influence of Hyde had been withdrawn, the doctor had returned to his old tasks and amities. A week ago, the prospect had smiled with every promise of a cheerful and an honoured age. And now, in a moment, friendship and peace of mind and the whole tenor of his life were wrecked. So great and unprepared a change pointed to madness. But in view of Lanyon's manner and words, there must lie for it some deeper ground. Well, he's absolutely right. There has to be more to it. Um, and even in Jekyll's words, there's something so terrifyingly final in them. He says, if I am the chief of sinners, I am also the chief of sufferers. So he's basically saying he has done wrong, not just any wrong. He's the chief of wrongdoing. But the, alongside that, he's also the, the chief of pain, of suffering. So, you know, something has happened monumental to cause uh, this decision from Jekyll to remain alone for the rest of his life and for Lanyon to never ever want to see him again. A week afterwards, Dr Lanyon took to his bed and in something less than a fortnight, he was dead. The night after the funeral, at which he had been sadly affected, Utterson locked the door of his business room and sitting there by the light of a melancholy candle, drew out and set before him an envelope addressed by the hand and sealed with the seal of his dead friend. Private, for the hands of J.G. Utterson alone, and in case of his predecease, to be destroyed unread. So it was emphatically superscribed, and the lawyer dreaded to behold its contents. I have buried one friend today, he thought. What if this should cost me another? And then he condemned the fear as a disloyalty and broke the seal. Within there was another enclosure, likewise sealed and marked upon the cover as not to be opened till the death or disappearance of Dr. Henry Jekyll. 
Patterson could not trust his eyes. Yes, it was disappearance here again, as in the mad will, which he had long ago restored to its author. Here again with the idea of a disappearance and the name of Henry Jekyll bracketed. So he's referring to Henry's will that he couldn't bear the sight of because it suggested that if he disappeared, his money would go to hide. And now these words, if Jekyll disappears rather than death, are being cited by Utterson. But in the will, that idea had sprung from the sinister suggestion of the man Hyde. It was set there with a purpose all too plain and horrible. Written by the hand of Lanyon, what should it mean? A great curiosity came to the trustee to disregard the prohibition and dive at once to the bottom of these mysteries. But professional honour and faith to a dead friend were stringent obligations and the packet slept in the inmost corner of his private safe. So he really wanted to open it, but then he was like, no, 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 no. I cannot go against what was said in the will, in the letter from, from Lanyon. It is one thing to mortify curiosity, another to conquer it. And it may be doubted if from that day forth, Utterson desired the society of his surviving friend with the same eagerness. He thought of him kindly, but his thoughts were disquieted and fearful. He went to call indeed, but he was perhaps relieved to be denied admittance. Perhaps in his heart, he preferred to speak with Poole upon the doorstep and surrounded by the air and sounds of the open city, rather than to be admitted into that house of voluntary bondage and to sit and speak with its inscrutable recluse. Poole had indeed no very pleasant news to communicate. The doctor, it appeared, now more than ever confined himself to the cabinet over the laboratory, where he would sometimes even sleep. He was out of spirits. He had grown very silent. He did not read. It seemed as if he had something on his mind. Utterson became so used to the unvarying character of these reports that he fell off little by little in the frequency of his visits. OK, so the only communication he's having now is via Paul the butler and the butler is saying to him the same things that he can't do anything. He's, he's obviously, you know, in turmoil. He's really perplexed. And in the end, Utterson's like, well, I mean, what can I do? You know, so mystery is abound. Um, I hope that was helpful. I hope that you understood everything that happened there. Uh, there will be some more detailed analytical videos coming your way chapter by chapter. So do keep uh, keep looking out for those. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. Um, and do check out the rest of my playlists for literature videos and uh, for any of the other texts that you're studying um, and helpful hints with your language as well. Right, that's it from me. Thank you so much for watching. Happy reading, happy revising.